So, uh, my name is Duncan Stroik. I'm a um, professor of architecture here, and I tell you that because I'm not really here right now. I'm on sabbatical, and so um, I don't exist. Um, and uh, since we have the uh, honor of having a, um, a uh, architect from the, um, the UK, we're going to start on time, or at least only five minutes late. Um, <laughs> So at Notre Dame, we love British architecture. We also like British architects. Why? Because we in America learned everything we know from them. And as you know, the American and the British are two people separated by a common language. <laughs> Hugh Petter is uh, really, he's an offensive line man, but rather better dressed. When he came, uh, to see us last night, I said football, and he said rugby. I said, why? He says, because, as you know, the British don't like to play sports where you can get hurt. <laughs> I asked him about teaching for us at Notre Dame one day, and he said he really doesn't like the commute. And I said, well, what about the other place? And he says he hates Italian food. Oh. Of course, I'm kidding, because that's where we met. Uh, Hugh Petter, uh, Samir Yunus, and I, teaching in the land of classical architecture, uh, whatever that city is called. And we had a great time together. And Hugh would come in on juries and regale us with uh, Lutchen's jokes and other good British uh, architecture things. Uh, well, this is in the days when we were both young and handsome architects, and he still is. <laughs> I was a lowly assistant professor, and he was staying, of course, at the British Academy because it was the only place you could get a good cup of tea. Um, when you get tired of all that, silly cappuccino and stuff. Um, he's a graduate of the University of Portsmouth, and he is a partner for many, many years, probably 25 or 28 or 30, in Adam Architects, which is the largest architecture firm in Great Britain. They have about 10 people. <laughs> Sorry, 85. And have recently hired some of our best and brightest from that are Irish people from here, and we're glad to hear about that. And, um, uh, and I was uh, surprised to see he is a member of 28 professional organizations, including he's the vice chairman of the Georgian Group, and I'm now going to read all his organizations to you. They're not. Um, and uh, he does work in, at all classical levels, uh, master planning, housing, residential, public housing, and uh, uh, high-end residential. Presently, he is doing the master plan for the new town or the second town of Poundbury, uh, which some of you know, some of you don't, you have to go there. Um, and it made me reflect on the history of Poundbury, the Prince of Wales, who is the patron, all of the great people, designers and architects who are involved in it. And thankfully, think about it, thankfully, the uh, British have not adopted the Euro. Poundbury, come on. Um, <laughs> Uh, uh, um, so, and then finally, for his manifold and brilliant work, which you're going to see tonight, uh, uh, he has 23 awards, uh, which again is incredible for a man this young. Um, and then I want to finally tell you about this new book, Hot Off the Press, which has a nice American, I mean, a Georgian house on the front of it. And this is the new book on the country house ideal from Adam Architecture, and Adam Architecture is an amazing uh, group uh, started by Robert Adam, and there are five partners, and they all do their own projects, and yet uh, amazing book of, of quality, beauty, and uh, well, whatever, firmness, commodity, and delight, you know what I mean. So please welcome Hugh Petter. Duncan, thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, as you heard, I first met um, Thomas Gordon-Smith, uh, Duncan, and uh, some of the rest of the faculty here uh, 25 years ago uh, in Rome. And uh, I have, on occasion, been back there and done various things. And uh, we've had events in London I've taken part in as well, but I've never been to South Bend uh, and to uh, Notre Dame until today. And it's a very great pleasure to be here without a doubt, the best school of architecture in the world. I mean that absolutely sincerely. So thank you very much for inviting me. Um, 
quick plug as well, as you've heard, we do employ uh, Notre Dame um, graduates. We've got, I think, two or three with us at the moment. Um, but we, it is a nightmare in terms of UK immigration. But if you are interested, do please um, get in touch and give it plenty of time. It does take a long time to go through the hoops. Um, but I'll do my best not to put you off um, over the course of this evening. Um, we also have a travel scholarship, and some of your graduates have won that in the past um, as well. Uh, it's on the um, theory that it's good to travel and to take time to look. And uh, our students have been all over the world uh, and have done all sorts of fascinating uh, bits of research, which we're going to put into a book hopefully in the next year for the first 10 years. Um, but if you are interested in that kind of thing, uh, do please look at our website uh, and apply next year because, as I say, you, know, you make very strong applications. It's great if more of you can get it. Um, so my subject tonight is working with tradition. It's very much uh, a personal view to, really, to how I like to work uh, with tradition, and it's a bit uh, disjointed in parts, but please bear with me and hopefully it'll add up to um, something by the end of it. Um, so I call the first section background. It's partly my own background in terms of my how I, where I came from uh, and my education and what I realized as I was um, taking root in the professional world. Um, I'd always had a, a love of traditional building, um, engendered partly by my parents, um, but uh, my, we holiday generally within the British Isles, and so a lot of time was spent looking at different parts of the country um, and realizing that vernacular traditional architecture gives you a very strong cultural identity and, and you can often tell whereabouts the building is in the world by its appearance. This building's main know is um, Horse Guards Parade in Whitehall in London, uh, mid 18th century building by William Kent, um, but I've always loved it. And it just shows my first slide to show a, a strong icon of London. Um, around the country, you get this very strong vernacular tradition um, as well. Uh, with um, different materials uh, manifesting themselves in different ways. So on the top left-hand side, a building from East Anglia on the eastern side of England with uh, an oak timber frame and clay tiles on the roof. Um, the roof pitches are often quite steep. And something I learned from Lutchins at a very young age was the angle of that roof, which is 54 and three quarter degrees. <coughs> you might think that's a really weird angle to pit, but if actually you have two planes that meet at that angle, the angle on the corner is 45 degrees. So if you're a carpenter, it makes making the roof so much easier. Um, and so these kinds of tricks where you get a, a geometric resolution, which creates a practical uh, resolution as well, I think it's very um, interesting to, to learn about. Um, on the right-hand side at the top is a house in Scotland, obviously very simple and stark, uh, very poor materials up there, so you have to be quite careful what you do, not be too clever with three-dimensional form. Um, and the cottage from the West Country with a thatched roof, again, not very many building materials in that part of the world. And then, obviously, uh, Cambridge, um, classic view from the river, um, where there are fantastic building materials and lots of money for um, handsome buildings. And some of these things were um, picked up on in the 19th century by the Arts and Crafts Movement, um, which some of you may be aware of, followers of William Morris, um, was a reaction really against the sort of industrialization of Britain and an attempt to recapture uh, a more vernacular, crafted way of building. Um, picking up on these regional identity and, and sort of use of materials in, in an appropriate way. On the top left hand side, you've got Philip Webb's uh, Red House for William Morris. On the right hand side at the top, uh, you've got um, a cottage in Leicestershire, which I've temporarily forgotten the name of the architect, it'll come back to me. Um, on the left hand side at the bottom, a cottage by Lutchins um, in Surrey in the south of England. And then on the right hand side, um, a house in Cambridge, um, which again is very much in that sort of arts and crafts tradition. You're going to have, um, Got the that architect for the moment as well. We'll come back to me later on. Um, and th their uh, work was very much inspired by the uh, writings of Pugin and uh, Ruskin. On the left hand side, you've got a page from Pugin's Contrast, where you can see he contrasts the sort of miserable life of the uh, workhouse in um, 19th century um, Britain with the uh, it, rural idyll of a, a medieval um, monastic lifestyle uh, from the Middle Ages. Uh, and, and trying to go back to a more sort of gothic, a cleaner, a more high living uh, period, if you like. And on Ruskin on the right hand side, with, with similar um, aspirations to, to, re to rediscover gothic architecture and a more crafted uh, form of building. Now, um, the myth in many um, uh, accounts of 20th century architecture is that the arts and crafts <coughs> movement morphed naturally in Britain into the modernist movement. Um, which is a complete and utter fallacy propagated by people like this chap at the bottom here, Nicholas Pevsner. And I found uh, in a writing he wrote just before he um, hung up his pen uh, that uh, you can see where he confessed, actually, he was biased in favour of modern architecture. Um, but most of the accounts that one reads of the arts and crafts movement and their ideals 
uh, in Britain certainly, was that it became uh, the modern movement, when in fact uh, what really happened was the arts and crafts ideals were exported um, to Germany, to the Bauhaus, and they were re-imported as a style um, later on. And when I was a student, I got very interested in the whole arts and crafts movement, and particularly what did happen to them, instead of going to become modernists. Uh, and if you look, uh, there's a lot of unpublished um, buildings, these ones actually are quite well known, um, but uh, many of them turned to classical architecture. On the face of it, there was this dilemma, how can a movement which came out of the Gothic revival start to manifest itself in a classical uh, manner, what, what's happened? Um, and uh, you can see, in fact, uh, from these buildings by Lutchin, there's the two at the top are early buildings by his, um, and the two at the bottom is uh, Homewood for his mother-in-law, and this one is Heathcote in um, Yorkshire, the turn of the century. Become, one of them is, is a sort of mixture of vernacular elements with classical uh, details, and then Heathcote obviously was his first fully blown um, classical composition. That, that there was a realization that actually there was a frustration sometimes in how you could uh, make Gothic work for certain kinds of uh, building type, whereas classicism was more flexible. And in fact, if one looked around the UK, uh, a lot of the buildings, the vernacular buildings, were classical in any event. And therefore, one could still have a regional character and a national style, if you like, expressed in a classical way. And you could also integrate the arts and so on. Uh, and it has a much less dogmatic approach um, to style. And then um, other examples here, um, the slide on the left is Beltram Heights Institute of Chartered Accountants in London, 1883. Uh, they were arts and crafts architects. And they went for this rather sort of Genovese-inspired um, Baroque style for this very exuberant building. Again, um, wonderfully incorporating the arts within architecture. On the top, on the right-hand side, you've got um, Philip Webb um, with his um, house in Surrey um, standing, which again is becoming more formalized, as you can see. And then on the bottom right, Halsey Ricardo's Debenham House in London, again, full of arts and crafts details, but expressed in a classical manner. And then um, William Letherby is one of the great sort of masters of modernism. And I've got a quote here, which is the only quote I'm going to sort of, um, read out to you tonight. Um, but it goes back to this point about um, the, what, what is actually being modern. The oldie modernist style is now regarded as a style, whereas being truly modern would be simply being right and reasonable. Reasonable building is not necessarily a series of boxes or a structure of steel. The most scientific building for given conditions might still be brick and thatch. I greatly fear that a modernist fashion will be imported as a style and not arrive as a natural growth of our own sound building customs. Modernism as an inverted archaeology is quite a different thing from experimenting with ourselves and being modern. Beware of a style called modernism. I, I found this as a student pretty powerful stuff, actually, because I was having modernism thrust down my throat uh, by certain um, tutors. And actually, this gave me some of the sort of ways of, of dealing with that. And if one trusts oneself that effectively you're becoming fluent in a language of design, in this case, a traditional language of design, you will speak in an original way and produce beautiful original things as part of a tradition. And you will be contemporary by virtue of that without having to worry about being self-conscious, about being uh, different from things that have gone before. And so following that thought through, the Windsor chair on the left-hand side is just as modern as Rietveld's uh, chair on the right-hand side, I would argue. Uh, and so on to the orders, which of course are you know, a fundamental part of all this. And at this point, I must acknowledge um, the two people who probably influenced me most as a student. I'm obviously very distinguished company with your faculty here um, tonight. The first is a fellow countryman of yours um, in the middle picture, Peter Hodson, who was my tutor at Portsmouth an American from the University of Virginia, but an absolutely fantastic character who, against the odds, uh, taught the orders to 30 years of British students, uh, much unappreciated by his peers, but much appreciated by his, um, those who listened to him. Uh, and my uh, friend and colleague, um, one-time boss, uh, Robert Adam, on the right-hand side, where I started as, as the office junior in the 1980s, and I'm now lucky enough to be a, um, an equal partner. Um, so on, on to classism, and um, obviously we know about the mythological origins of, of the orders. We all speculate on those. Um, this is a plate on the left-hand side from Robert's book um, showing the possible uh, origins of the Doric order as part of a um, timber frame um, Greek temple. And on the right-hand side was a project I did with my students back in the 1990s uh, as an exploration of those sorts of ideas, uh, which also doubled up as a shelter for a, a dishoused colony of bats, hence the um, sort of fasci style um, columns, creating a place where they can go and hide. Um, in point, terms of classical architecture, one, there's a number of key ideas which are interesting to explore for a minute. One is the evolution of detail. On the left hand side here, I show you the Doric order of the Theatre of Marcellus in Rome, which is unusual because it has a, a cavetto for the top molding and it has a dental 
corners who are kind of more familiar on the ionic order. And then in the middle um, slide is uh, Vignola's version of the Doric, where he takes those idiosyncratic details and adds his own uh, idiosyncratic two torus base. And then on the right hand side is Bernini's um, Piazza of San Pietro in, in Rome. Uh, and we know that uh, Vignola had a copy of Vignola in his library. And if you look at the detail, you can see again a two torus Vignola base there, but this time stretched to ionic proportion. So you get this wonderful sort of theme of change and continuity as the tradition evolves and reinvents itself um, over the centuries. Similarly, on this slide, on the top left-hand side, uh, you've got the top cornice from the Colosseum in Rome with a very unusual Sima Reversa uh, frieze bracket. On the top right-hand side, you've got Serlio, uh, who produces a door case with the same sort of theme in his um, treatise. On the bottom left-hand side, you've got Vignola's uh, cornice from the Palace of Palazzo Farnese at Caprarola, where he adds another bracket on top of the frieze bracket. And then later on in the 16th century, you've got Bernini's Palazzo Odescalci in Rome, where he takes the theme of a frieze bracket again and develops it in a different way once more. Another aspect is you can make a direct quote back to antiquity as well. This is one of Jefferson's uh, pavilions from the um, University of Virginia with the Doric of Albano, the Doric with the neutral block missing, with the good eye pegs hanging down like um, buck teeth. Um, then there are the points about selective detail. These are going to plates from Robert's book on the um, classical uh, language, where you take a, a bog standard Doric um, door case and start to peel the details off. And as designers, we all know about um, being selective with our detail and how you can pair the basic design back to create more interesting things. On the right hand side, how you can use the orders to manipulate um, scale and create hierarchy in different ways. So it's the same building dressed up in different ways. And then there's this obviously scope for innovation and invention. Obviously, you've got the Trobes, all American, corn on the cob order, and tobacco leaf order too, which we all uh, admire. Um, as you heard, I was very lucky to be a, a Rome scholar in my youth, and I had indecent luck and won it twice. Uh, and I was studying the late 19th century development of Rome after unification. And this um, pair of images I show you here was from the um, Gallery of Modern Art, which was uh, for an exhibition in 1911. Uh, when they celebrated the 50 years of the state of Italy. Um, and on the left-hand side, you can see the date 1861, which is when the state of Italy was declared. And then on the right-hand side was 1911, um, the state of this particular um, anniversary. And of course, in 1861, the Pope was in uh, power, so it was all very proper. And the victories there with their laurel wreaths are all very uh, well-dressed. On the right-hand side, well, what can I say? <laughs> Letting it all hang out. Um, and it's really just an example, an amusing example of how you can integrate sculpturing in classical architecture, but how also you can convey meaning, often quite subtle political meanings yes. or other things of various kinds um, as well. Another building familiar to those of you who have been to Rome, the monument to Victor Emmanuel II, the mm -hmm. first king of United Italy, who died a few years after unification. And whilst many people hate the monument for where it sits, and, and it's a rather brash appearance, it is a complete essay in, in symbolic classical um, design. You've got the quadriga on the top, the, the statue of the king, uh, Nike figures symbolizing victory. And you can see on the front, on the left-hand side there, these um, ship's prows, which um, are rostra, which were the prows of a, a navy that the Romans defeated in the Battle of Antium in 330 BC. And they sawed the battering rams off the front of these boats and took them back to the speaker's rostrum in Forum. And it became recognized as a symbol of power and victory uh, and was then used in, in that stylized form thereafter. And then similarly on the um, base here, you get another uh, victory figure with a bundle of um, bound uh, oak twigs. And if you look very carefully, some of the acorns are missing from the oak, uh, from their cups as well. That again was a recognized funereal motif. So it is a monument absolutely loaded through with literary classical uh, references. And it's really fascinating. The more you get to look at it, the more you see. Um, it's not all about decoration, of course. Uh, this is, um, on the left-hand side, um, a um, double cortile palazzo, which was invented by the architect Amanati in the Cinquecento. It was never, never built, um, and the book was never published, but it sits in the uh, archives of the Academia di San Luca, which is the um, architecture school in Rome. Um, in the 18th century, Ferdinando Fuga, who built this Palazzo Corsini, in Trastevere actually built, I think, the first double cortile um, palazzo in the city. And how you can take the formula of a palazzo and you can extend it and, and make it bigger. And in the 19th century, after unification, when they were needing to build ministries, they then doubled it again. So you get um, ministry buildings with four, four 
um, cortile and so on. So you can take building types and evolve them over time to deal with um, different needs as well. Uh, another slide from 19th century Rome. Um, as Italy industrialized in the end of the 19th century, they started their own heavy um, iron industry. And the slide on the right-hand side is from an aquarium, a public instruction building that was built by the new administration. And with the advent of cast iron columns, there was a, obviously a dilemma, how do you articulate them? What do you make them look like? And this was something which they debated um, at quite some length in contemporary accounts of the time. And um, a, an architect archeologist called Luigi Canina, who lived in Rome, um, produced a, a slim book called Thin Forms in Domestic Architecture, which was this uh, series of plates of effectively Pompeian second and fourth style uh, wall paintings with antique, thin, possibly thin candelabra, which they used to create a sense of false perspective. But of course, with cast iron for the first time, you could actually build um, columns of those sorts of dimensions. And so you find that all the cast iron in Rome, whether it's in buildings or street furniture, refers directly back to Roman wall paintings. And this particular plate on the left-hand side comes from the bars of Titus. So again, it's a wonderful way of you know, uh, tradition being used to reinvent itself to deal with new types of material uh, as well. Um, and going beyond architecture to urban planning, we'll come back to that later on um, towards the end of this talk. Um, in 1873, the first master plan for the expansion of Rome was uh, written up. And of course, unlike Paris, where um, under Hausmann, the old city was just obliterated and they started again. There wasn't the cash in Italy to do that. And also the whole point of um, making Rome the capital of New Italy was to identify with Rome's past. And so the, the two problems on the one hand, how you could open up the historic core of the medieval um, and ancient city by carving new routes and widening streets through it. And also then how you could graft new quarters onto the edge of the um, historic town. Uh, and you can see um, Santa Maria Maggiore there, how um, Sixtus V star plan of Rome, which gave you very um, well-defined routes into and through the historic city, uh, was used as the core of, of grafting these new quarters onto the historic plan. And the quote at the bottom there, which I won't read out, you can read it yourself, just shows you a much more interesting sort of picturesque or, or townscape -y approach to master planning about just pick, picking out the most important monuments and drawing the best straight line through them and thinking about how you experience uh, urban form uh, and how you might respond to that in terms of how you um, design the new streets. So, moving on to architecture and, and our own um, work. And the slide on the right was the, um, what is the British Academy, where I was lucky enough to be for two years. Um, and originally it was built for the same exhibition in 1911. And Edwin Lutchins was the architect, you've heard his name mentioned um, tonight. And bizarrely, the British government, who was the client for this project, said you must copy the upper tier of the west front of St. Paul's Cathedral, which I'll show you on the left here. Quite why um, a cathedral by Christopher Wren was thought to be a suitable symbol for Italy and England is beyond me, um, but that was the instruction. Now, by good fortune, St. Paul's was Lutchins' favorite building. He could draw large parts of it from memory. So for him, this is an absolute dream commission. And if you look at the building on the right, even if it's slightly out of focus, you can see, in fact, it's completely different from the one um, <laughs> on the left. So he had enormous fun redesigning his favorite building. And the Italians thought it was such a good um, a building, they gave the site to Britain, and the government thought it was the most marvelous copy. So everyone was happy. <laughs> and so um, after I left um, there, having taken the precaution of writing a small and rather dull book about the history of the building, um, I got the job of renovating it uh, in stages and then extending it. Um, and the planning policy in Rome is very complicated. And it works on the volume of building um, for a given size of plot. And this building really exceeded the upper limit of that. And also it was listed as a historic landmark as well. And so it was very difficult to find ways in which the building could be expanded. Um, but we found on the one hand that buildings that were underground were excluded. Uh, and also if we could argue something was part of an older part of an unrealized design, that would also create a loophole that we could exploit. Um, so taking the underground building first, the ground rises either side of the um, historic building. So we dug it back on the right-hand side of the facade and created a new lecture theater and an art gallery, um, which is set into the ground uh, with its own entrance onto the piazza. And the building next to Lutchens is not something for the faint hearted really. And uh, I was slightly daunted by what one would do. And I also had the problem of the um, Venice Charter, which um, prevails in Italy, which means you're not allowed to put classical extensions on classical buildings anymore. Uh, and I managed to box my way around that. And the way we um, did it was to say, I went to see the people in Rome with Lutchin's drawings and Wren's drawings and my own drawings. And I told them the story about how Lutchin's uh, reinvented Wren. And then I felt if we were gonna go next to Lutchin's, we should make some key 
uh, subtle things to show that it was a later in intervention. And so uh, the building, two slides on the right-hand side at the bottom of the Middleton Bank headquarters building in London, where Lutchins um, had these uh, disappearing collapses. You can see that just the capitals and the bases pop out, otherwise it's a rusticated wall. So I thought it'd be quite fun to um, put those rusticated okay, disappearing pilasters either side here. And then on, on Wren's drawing, this is the upper tier of the west front, you get these um, segmental headed arches there. And so one of those appears over the front too. So it's trying to go back to the original language of, of um, St. Paul's and put it together in a different way whilst creating something which has enough presence on the street um, to work as an entrance without unbalancing the rest of the elevation. And the other project there was a, a extension to the library and we found that Lutchins had a plan for a colonnaded um, veranda, which was never built. And so that was an easy win, just build the colonnade, glaze it. There was an extra 15 years of growth and a, a nice new reading room as well. Um, and in terms of our story here, I mentioned the angle of Lutchins roof pitches, 54 and three quarter degrees. That was, if you went to work in his office, you were given a set square with that the day you arrived. And all his classical moldings at that angle as well. So all his cornices are at that steeper angle and very distinctive. And so all the mouldings here, are, again, at the same angle, so it hopefully it feels it relates to the um, older building. Um, now, another aspect of all this is another type of work we do quite a lot of, is working on historic buildings. Um, this was rather a severe case, as you can see. Unfortunately, a fire had gutted uh, what was originally a 17th century um, timber-framed house. Uh, and I think rather like that slide I showed you of Jefferson's um, being on the lawn in Virginia, the objective here in my mind was just to do as, uh, as quietly as possible to put the uh, character of the house back again. Uh, and so it was just a matter of using the right materials, um, looking carefully at what was there, understanding the structure of the house and just piecing in new bits of timber where you needed to uh, and trying to make it breathe again in, in a, a gentle way uh, using lime-based um, renders and mortars and so on. Uh, and hopefully you wouldn't necessarily know we'd been there by the time we finished. But of course, at the same time, it was a listed historic building with a massively inconvenient plan, and now every bedroom has an ensuite bathroom, and it performs as a modern house too. So it was trying to sort of get the best out of uh, a disaster whilst not losing the character of an historic building. Um, another uh, project, this time for a new house, was in a, a town called Cheltenham in the west of England, um, which was a, a early, late 18th, early 19th century spa town, built very quickly with a lot of these rather charming, restrained, sort of slightly Greek, uh, Regency Villas. Um, and there was one piece of Cheltenham, which is a bit like Regent's Park, with a big park in the middle with these grand houses around the edge of it. Uh, and one of them had a 1970s sort of Californian ranch style house there, which um, we thought was rather ugly. And our client bought it uh, and asked us to put this back in its place. Apart from the local architect's panel saying it was a sad loss of an interesting building, everyone else seemed pretty pleased to see the back of it. Um, again, the objective here, uh, in my mind, was to um, make it sit as quietly as possible amongst its neighbours while making it a, a, you know, a, a beautiful and attractive modern um, house. So the porch uh, is taken with the, the Greek Ionic order of um, Eleusius, uh, so a particular Greek order from antiquity, and otherwise it's really very restrained um, with um, band courses and done by proportion and implication rather than elaborate mouldings. Um, the plan uh, was very simple and geometric as well, and I, whilst in Rome I got very interested in proportion and how the antiques of use of geometry for practical purposes became stylized in the Renaissance uh, and theories of proportion start to emerge. Uh, and my client in this case was a retired banker who effectively was an architect monke, um, and he had as much of a hand in this as I did really, um, but we decided to use a 15 foot module for the um, plan as the base form. So the rooms of their square are 15 foot square or some proportion of that. Um, and also, the, the plan being very square in form for the main block of the house is economical to build. All the main walls line up. Um, and this is the first example I'm going to show you, what we call in the office the donut plan. Remember where you heard it first. Uh, this is where you get um, a square or deep plan house with a central staircase, which can be lit from above. It's an extremely efficient plan form. Um, for this sort of villa scale of, of um, house, the, the light from above is very intense, and so it creates a very good natural light from the core of it, and it creates an extremely efficient overall plan. The first floor is pretty much on the same theme with a series of bedrooms and obviously the en suites and so on people expect. Um, and they get back again, very restrained with a terrace with a pool and down onto the lawn. Um, it was built on quite a tight budget uh, and uh, we couldn't afford a natural stone staircase and so part of the reason for going for a semi-circular shape was to use cast stone 
Um, and this only has three molds. It has the bottom step with a bull nose on it, a typical riser, and the landing one piece of stone uh, at the top. So it was not much more expensive than a timber staircase. It obviously creates a very strong feature uh, in the core of the house. Other than that, the rooms are really very restrained. There's a cornice in every case, but most of the other moldings are, are staff beads, the odd um, door surround, but really very restrained. And we find increasingly, actually, that our clients in Britain, they want a traditional looking house on the outside, but the inside wants to be much more restrained uh, and uh, more free flowing than it would have been, say, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, this was quite an early um, commission, actually, but rather a, a dream one. Um, sadly, not for myself. Uh, this was actually came through Norman Foster's office, um, who um, a client of theirs who was a London property man um, uses them for his own work, but didn't want to live in a Foster's house. And they very kindly pushed us our way. So we're in the Bahamas, um, and um, it was my first trip to that part of the world. And the, the plot sits at the edge of a long straight road uh, with its back onto the dune crest. So I felt that a Palladian concept would be quite appropriate there, both as often you see them used elsewhere in that part of the world. But also the house which will dominate the view at the end of the um, approach road, which would then effectively become its drive. And it would, it would hold back the view of the sea from visitors until they actually get um, to the front door. Um, so again, a very simple plan. This is a slightly bigger house on an 18 foot module, but again, with very simply proportioned rooms, which are either square or double square. Uh, and the height of the ceilings are 12 foot. So again, a nice sort of simple uh, geometric relationship. Um, with a vestibule, a double height cube hall, a, a drawing room in the middle at the back, um, a library at one end, a kitchen at the other end with a family room off the other. So you can go and sort of read your magazine at that end and your children can go and watch television at the other end. It's all very, very straightforward. Um, and then at the back, the wings will crawl around to the side to, to enclose a, um, a pool which has an infinity edge going onto the sea. So that's the view when you arrive. Only when you get to the front door do you actually get a glimpse of the ocean um, beyond. And at the back, a double height um, porch goes along the elevation. And I felt because we were in the Caribbean, it's a slightly crazy um, place, that it, we ought to have a bit of fun um, as well. Uh, and of course, when you stack up the orders, you have a problem with the base of the upper order overhanging the cornice of the lower order, particularly if you don't want a particularly bold projecting cornice at that level. So I thought it'd be quite amusing to have um, antiquity on the Renaissance. So you've got a Vitruvian order on the top there, and then Vignola underneath. Um, as sort of part of that Caribbean spirit, hopefully. Um, and those are the interiors, very simple again. Uh, everything had to be made of mahogany, it's anything the termites couldn't blunt their teeth on, um, and uh, it wasn't, uh, didn't fall to bits in the saline wind. Uh, another, I'll just show you a couple of slides of this. This is another example of a donut plan finished um, last year. Uh, this time it was a stone uh, finished house. Uh, and we were just talking with Duncan before um, the lights went down tonight. Uh, one of the biggest <laughs> challenges we face in Britain is how to get masonry with the tightest joints possible. And I think for what I do, there's, there's the pleasure in design, but there's also the pleasure in execution and getting the craftsmanship uh, right. And, and actually talking to these people and working with them to get the details right is immensely satisfying and, and hopefully shows in a better building at the end of it. And also designing all the lead off the top of the stone too, so you just get the purity of the stone uh, un unencumbered by nasty bits of metal uh, on the elevation. Um, this next um, building I'm going to show you uh, is... Uh, one of a number of buildings we've done of this kind. Uh, this one sadly never got built, um, but it was a, a sort of an exceptional house which gets built on the site of, of an old house uh, under particular planning loopholes that we can exploit. And this was a site in the hills um, south of London where there had been this enormous house in the 19th century, uh, which the Canadian Army had occupied during World War II. By the time they left, there wasn't much left to worry about. Um, but it was on top of a hill with the most lovely view uh, in all directions. The house that was there at the moment is this horrible little bungalow, um, which includes bits of the old house. Um, it really does not exploit its amazing setting um, properly. So the plan was to put a significant house back there, exploiting this planning loophole. Um, and to help make the justification for it, it had to be truly outstanding. Uh, and we felt that um, we could have some fun with invention in the classical tradition, but also it should be um, a true zero carbon um, house. So we worked with the um, government's advisors on um, sustainability towards um, a program to that end, looking particularly at energy, water, and waste as our three uh, key areas. One of the problems that the planners pushed us was the new house had to be big enough to hold the view 
uh, the house on pink is the, the bungalow I've just shown you. The house with the red outline was the house that was there in the first photograph. And no way did our client want to put a house of 80,000 square foot back on the site. So the exam question was how to create a house with enough presence in the landscape to do the job of holding the view without breaking our client's piggy bank. Um, also, the setting of the house survived as well. And so we had this significant change in level with wall gardens and so on at the lower level. And it was devising a form of house that could exploit that with a pool and so on linked to the house through this sort of uh, orangery at the lower level that would um, feel like it belongs to it. Um, the house itself was again very square in plan because the external wall areas um, want to minimize that sustainability to minimize the heat loss. Uh, it was a donut plan as well, so we can use the double height central hall uh, to ventilate the house naturally um, as well. And uh, in terms of its elevation, it was a sort of play on the Villa Rotunda theme with a different. Um, Autogo on each elevation. And you can see on these contextual photographs how the drawings how it sits in its um, garden setting. Uh, in terms of the detail, on the left hand side, you've got Romantes and Infeum at uh, Genzano outside Rome, uh, with this, I'm sure you've all been there when you were in Italy yourselves, uh, the detail where the um, cornice of a minor order becomes the capital of a, a major uh, order. You can see this right at the top there. And so on this portico, you get the giant Corinthian order. On this one, on another face, you get the stacked orders where um, the architrave um, becomes, you see the base bed molds of the, the main cornice become a mini uh, cornice and entablature for the um, upper order. Um, so the way in which we got to zero carbon uh, was minimizing energy through extra insulation and air tightness, and then um, using a German technology for um, rapeseed oil, which comes in a um, CHP, combined heat and power plant, like, like a big generator effectively, where the heat's used to heat the water um, as well. And in terms of the reduction you get, uh, you can see from the bottom, that there's various things you can do that reduce your carbon footprint. But the big move is to use this uh, biomass fuel, which makes a huge reduction in terms of, of the um, emissions that the house would um, present. Um, that one didn't get built for various um, planning reasons, but um, this one, it's going to get built. It's another zero carbon house uh, in Cornwall, in the west of England. Uh, again, true zero carbon, um, where we're using um, preheated air from pipes under the ground and photovoltaic technology. But you can see from the outside, it's a um, very um, quiet, traditional uh, Cornish manor house on, on a site that goes back to the doomsday. It's a very ancient site, which we're very excited about. Um, going up the scale, um, this house is definitely not zero carbon. <laughs> I never thought this house was ever going to get built. Originally, it was for a Russian client who had bought a, an estate um, near Windsor. And they sent me a photograph and said, um, do me some design of ideal for a house. <laughs> and I said, OK. So we agreed an hourly rate. And I produced an arts and crafts version, a Palladian version. I thought, well, what the hell? I love the Baroque. So we'll have a go at Castle Howard. So I produced um, this as, a, as an idea. I like this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I said, fine, we'll base a house on this concept. Well, no, I like this one. So we had the bizarre situation where the elevation was fixed, but there was no plan and no program. Behind it. So I said, well, what do you want in your house? If you want an expert, you'll tell me. So um, I got paid by the hour to, to produce, um, I thought, you know, it was a house never ever going to get built. And it, it was on, they had an existing consent for a house of 55,000 square foot. Um, so it's partly how you're going to make the most of the site and, and the space, really. So uh, it has a, a central spine um, wide corridor hall, and the rooms will come off that, and then the wings are used for various sort of minor um, features, and it steps back as well, so you get nice um, terraces at higher level as you go up the building. Um, and um, anyway, I, I thought it was never going to get built, and, and uh, I went to see him with an idea of how much it's going to cost, and expecting to lose my kneecaps, and he just seems to take it on the chin. But then I said, well, if that's how you feel, that's fantastic, but you ought to go and get some agent uh, input to make sure you don't spend too much money on the site. And it was going to be too expensive, so he lost interest. And it was bought by an Indian developer who normally works in central London. Uh, and they, they just said, we're going to build it, much to my um, delight and surprise. And this was the perspective of the original design. The planners wouldn't have the dome, so that had to come off. But we did put the extra orangery on the um, bottom for um, so it looks more like Chatsworth now than, than, uh, than Castle Howard. But anyway, it is being built um, as we speak. Um, we had a wonderful job with another Notre Dame graduate, uh, James Coyle, I think, who helped us with the stone package on the external uh, elevations. We were talking with Duncan earlier about the technology um, for these sorts of big 
stone built houses. We build them with a concrete box as the core of it. And then you offer stone up onto the outside, but the concrete structure means you get a roof on it more quickly. So you can start to bring forward the interior and the concrete is also fantastically inert substrate you can put stone up against um, as well. And that seems to work very well. But of course, part of the question here, which James and I worked on together was how you can get a scalar block which works with the architecture. If the stones are too small, it would look completely ridiculous. Uh, at the same time, big stones are not that easy to come by in Britain as well. So it was a very interesting um, process. And um, I'll show you another shot of it there. There is under construction. Now, we found that in Britain, we just couldn't get stones of the right size and the right quantity to build it. And so we had to go to France, um, to Burgundy, where they just basically, uh, whereas in Britain, we, we mine our stone. In, in France, they just blow the face off the mountain. And whatever size the blocks are at the bottom, that's the size of block you get to build with, because any imperfection comes out as it falls down the hill. So it is quite sensible, really. Uh, and um, they, they um, uh, again, rather to my surprise, uh, in previous projects, I've worked with an architectural model, and we produced um, uh, clay maquettes of all the um, classical details to get them correct. The deal they arranged with these French quarries was so unbelievably good, we just kept on producing stone samples until they were correct. And they carved these things with a, with a computer, with CNC technology. So the Corinthian capital there, apart from the um, legs on the B, uh, the sort of play on the Barberini B, because their company was called Bath and Bath, uh, was all done on, on a computer and just finished off by hand. And you can see again the black box um, with the stone being offered up against it um, as we speak. But the, the quality really is extraordinarily good. And again, the joints are lovely and uh, tight uh, as well. Um, a different kind of project, and, and sometimes you get a client who wants to be a bit more edgy. Um, and this was for a, um, a retirement apartment block in the Channel Islands to the south of England, uh, where they wanted something a bit more coastal, a bit more sort of art deco y. Uh, and I looked this time to um, sort of Scandinavian classicism and Swedish grace is a more abstracted form of classicism where uh, apart from the Doric column in the middle on the front and the Anthemian, there's not much in the way of classical detail. There's also a bronze uh, temple on the top in the penthouse, but other than that, it's really just about proportion and sort of implied um, pilasters. At the other end of the spectrum, we looked at the start of vernacular classicism. This is a golf club I built in a sensitive landscape location, uh, where again, it's an actually an oak frame building um, with weatherboarded walls um, and just uh, classical details on the main windows uh, and a Doric um, colonnade. Um, this is a, um, not quite as, as big as your wonderful stadium here. This is uh, the Oval Cricket Club in London, one of the home of uh, cricket for us uh, in our side of the pond. Uh, it's owned by the Duchy of Cornwall, the, the Prince of Wales um, estate. And uh, I was acting for them initially on a, a master plan for how to make their site come to life. Uh, on the one hand, it's face to the street was really ghastly with this horrible 1960s building on the main road you approach the um, site from. There was lots of other sort of leftover land and they wanted to make um, more seats to make it more money out of the ground um, as well and tidy the whole thing up. So having produced a master plan, um, the first phase was to put a new entrance uh, on the building. And originally when the pavilion was built, the pavilion is a red brick building behind, there was a pub building uh, where this horrible blue thing is that had a better face to the street. That was demolished in the 1960s and the, um, that building was put up instead. When that building came down, it's how you can put a front on the back of a building, or someone said lipstick on the gorilla. Um, <laughs> and the building behind was a building that had evolved over time too, so it was not um, a facade ever meant to be seen. Uh, and we tried to pick out lines off the elevation that would have some sort of resonance and, and could be expressed to the new uh, portico that would be the new entrance to members of this um, August Cricket Club. We had some fun in the details as well. Uh, the Prince of Wales crest is ostrich feathers, which is also the crest of the cricket club. And this time I did manage to work with my friend, um, Charles Gurry, who's an architectural model. I worked with Dick Reed uh, for many years. Uh, and we modeled and designed these um, capitals together uh, in clay. And then they were carved um, in stone by, again, a CNC computer uh, and just finished off by hand to get that nice sort of light fluffy feel um, on, on the stone. And then the Ashes cricket match, which is an annual competition of England against Australia. The first match was played at, at the Oval. Um, and so we put some urns up too that were reminiscent of the Ashes urns to have some fun uh, with that as well. Uh, and now to America. Um, some of you may know uh, Rodney Cook. I'm sure he's been here over the years. Um, when I was teaching at the Prince of Wales Institute, Rodney was a great supporter um, in, in America. And when the Olympics happened in Atlanta, 
um, he thought there should be an official monument uh, to the event. The one on the right uh, is the one that was the official one that, that uh, uh, got built, which seems to have lost all sense of monumentality, uh, really. It's more like Disneyland to me than, than uh, a serious classical monument. And so he had a competition amongst um, our students and alumni, uh, which a Russian student, um, Anton Glikin, uh, won. And then he worked with Victor Dupi, who I think has also been on the faculty here, to produce the working drawings. And Rodney raised the money, and they built this monument on the left-hand side uh, in Atlanta, in downtown, in a rather de um, deprived uh, neighborhood. And you can see it's got the five columns for the five um, different uh, continents and five atlas figures holding up the world in a united way. Uh, and to Rodney's surprise and delight, it became a catalyst for every generation in that part of uh, town, people putting buildings near the monument. And so energized was he by this uh, experience that he decided to have a go for a Millennium uh, Monument uh, too, which originally was going to be in DC. I think, uh, Thomas, you may have been involved in that at one point um, as well. And um, at Barney Circle, one of L'Enfant's Rompoir, which it was sort of a suitable site coming across from the end, across the river from Maryland to put a, a, a symbolic entrance into um, DC. And so a competition was held again amongst students and young architects, um, and uh, a shortlist were chosen. And then um, they worked that up a bit further, but that site got stuck for political reasons. And in the interim, um, this site in Atlanta, which DPZ had done a, a master plan for, um, became available in Midtown. It was the site of an old steel mill. And um, uh, by this stage, a lot of the people who had originally been involved with it had um, left uh, the team. And so I was asked um, to help Rodney um, redesign the um, Washington building for this smaller site um, in Atlanta. So you might say it was Honey, I Shrunk the Arch. Um, no, no. The left-hand one was the competition-winning design, and then you can see how we had to reduce it for the um, smaller site uh, on the right. In this project, I worked with Sandy Stoddart, the Queen sculptor in Scotland, who's the most fantastic um, character. Some of you may have met him in the past um, as well. And the theme for the, the sculpture here was to capture the Millennium uh, message. And on each of the four piers of the arch, we were going to have a figure representing an epoch of 500 years. So antiquity, Middle Ages, Renaissance, and the modern age. And then because it was part of an urban regeneration scheme, we we're going to have the civilizing values of peace and justice on the um, peripheral um, sculpture groups, as you can see uh, in his sketch there. Yeah, it shows a slightly more refined uh, version of the same uh, concept. Um, needless to say, for commercial reasons, the inside was stuffed full of goodies, uh, naming opportunities. That, and, but to be fair, you know, money was raised. Um, from Alexandria, symbols of antiquity, to try and give it a particular resonance um, and meaning. And then uh, this is um, goddess Irene with Plutus, a little impetuous nymph, uh, symbolizing peace. You can see in the earlier maquette there, she's got a, a, a palm frond, again, uh, making the same um, gesture. And then the Nike figure above is the victory of peace. And in terms of how he makes it, there's the uh, armature you can see on the left-hand side, and then modeled up in clay. Uh, and it's very difficult to model in clay at that very large scale. He makes a, a small maquette and then divides that with a grid, and then just grows the whole thing up proportionally by putting a grid around the, the full-size one as well. And you can see uh, how wonderfully he makes the material flow. And it's cast in plaster and then um, cast in bronze. And it was actually cast in Britain and then taken over on the ship and then paraded through um, Georgia on the Very exciting. Uh, and there's the art finished as well. So uh, a few slides now on um, urban design. And as Duncan's very kindly said at the outset, um, one of my jobs over the last um, 12 years has been uh, working with the Duchy of Cornwall, the Princess Foundation, on the next Poundbury, the urban extension to uh, Newquay in Cornwall. Uh, it will be in time be twice the size of Poundbury. Um, and um, I won't be around when it's finished, that's for sure. Uh, but the idea was to build off the principles upon which Poundbury is founded, um, but to make sustainability the most um, sort of significant uh, driver for the whole scheme. Um, the slide I show you here are four um, slides, not of my work, you'll be glad to hear, but of what goes up in Cornwall um, generally with materials that vaguely they come from that part of the world, but with very badly designed public realm uh, and altogether not very inspirational. 
So um, this is Cornwall, and uh, this is Newquay. It's on the north coast of this sort of thing, on the bottom southwest side of Britain. It's a coastal town. Um, originally, it was um, a port here for a fishing fleet. Uh, in the 19th century, um, a lot of the minerals in Cornwall were taken around the bottom of the country up to the Midlands, to the ports there. And the sea is very rough on the very southwest corner. So they built a railway across Cornwall, uh, and uh, sorry, the um, harbour had a second career as a commercial port. And then um, in the early 20th century, there's a fantastic surfing beach here, the best surfing beach um, in Britain. It had a third um, career as a, an upmarket holiday resort. Uh, and now I'm afraid um, the profile of surfing dudes has gone down a bit, and it's sort of teenage love capital of the southwest. And where they all sleep, really best not to ask. But the population goes from 20,000 in the winter to 110,000. Um, in high summer. Um, the land I show you here in, in yellow is the Duchy of Cornwall's um, estate, and the red line I show you is the sort of broad area of search where they think the town could be extended. And you can see it's uh, in board from the sea, um, and there's a valley effectively with a stream at the bottom of it here. There's also a railway line that goes, the one I mentioned earlier on, which has potential for a new rail hold um, as well. At the moment, in addition, on the railway line, there are a couple of outbreak crossings here where people die um, quite regularly. So the part of the motivation was to um, close those and put a new bridge over the railway crossing, which is always a nightmare. If you're trying to, you'll know what I mean. Um, but also, um, Cornwall is a very poor part of the United Kingdom, and I think um, a lot of councils are terrified of housing, and they spread a few houses here and a few houses there, and hope the problem will go away. And the Cornwall Council, to their term on credit, said, "No, no." We want development here as a catalyst for regeneration. So they gave us this area to look at. We worked out which bits you couldn't build on, uh, and then talked to the local people about how you, uh, what they might want if the town were to expand. Um, and we produced a long list of, of um, desire requirements that they would they would have, and we were able to do a capacity study, uh, and to realise that over time it could be another four thousand houses. And so normally in Britain we only had to look for the next five years for planning, but here we were able to look fifty years ahead to the full um, 4,000. That was, you know, it means you can start to create a proper place rather than just a housing estate. Um, that's just another view of the same thing, we can probably move on. Um, so the first task was to write uh, a pattern book um, for Yuki uh, to help us understand what we were dealing with and to help us to engage with the local um, people as well. And I must acknowledge a debt here to um, UDA to Ray Gindros and Rob Robinson, who um, were extremely helpful in the early days of, of sharing with us their experience of um, a, a, a pattern books uh, and how they work. And this was the, the 10 underlying principles, um, which really guided everything we've done. It needs to be led through public consultation, uh, guided by a master plan. It must be sustainable. Uh, it must have local identity and use Cornish resources. And it was a eureka moment here because we realized that for cheap fossil fuel, vernacular building was sustainable. It couldn't be unsustainable by its very nature. So as a starting point, that was fantastic. Of course, there was no book, no box to tick on any measure of sustainability, saying it was a good thing to use local resources. If you stop and think about it, if all your materials, labor and components come from the surrounding hinterland, the economic dividend these people get is absolutely enormous. And in a deprived area like Cornwall, that's extremely welcome. And so as a consequence, we get uh, an approach to development which is going to look distinctively and, and regional which is popular uh, and um, you know, which everyone benefits from. So uh, we, we think this is a very nice virtuous circle. It needs to respond to their needs. It needs to relate to the historic part of the town, think about the impact on the environment, use land efficiently and indeed be viable. Um, and we'll come back to that issue of viability in, in a minute. Um, so in terms of how the project was structured, it's quite unusual. And I, I, I recommend this as a way of thinking about um, commercial development. It's in my mind, inspiration, again, it wasn't my idea, but it, it just works so well. And it starts with the landowner um, laying an egg in terms of a vision. So that the um, diagram on the left-hand side uh, gives you a, a suite of documents that they produce. So there's the public consultation, sustainability strategy, an energy strategy, uh, a food strategy. Food is 23% of your carbon footprint and therefore very important. And looking at green infrastructure, the pattern book we know about, the master plan, the water strategy, transport strategy, and then guided through a building code, how you deliver it. So all these documents were prepared first. And then three house builders were invited to come forward and they uh, each put in a quarter of the cost of that delivering that vision. And as it goes forward, uh, they take it in terms to build out each phase and they agree a, a sales price per square foot on a student sales price for, for the phase they're working on. 
just on an open book basis at the end of that phase, they tot up the average price. And if it's more than the base price of the first phase, that becomes the base price of the second phase. So the house bill is always one step ahead. But everyone's incentivized to get the best value and create the best place out of it. Fantastic model. Because you've got the repeat house bills going around, they can set up long-term local supply chains um, as well. So I think you know, this is really very exciting. I can tell you already, we've sold two phases. Price has gone up six pounds a square foot. That creates immediately another 18 million of, of value on the scheme. We've only just started um, building. So in terms of long-term value for the landowner, it's fantastic news um, as well. So back to the pattern book. Um, this was our analysis of the urban form um, of Newquay, looking at the character of different types of street, the types of buildings along the edge of those streets, and the typical dimensions and other um, attributes. The types of buildings, uh, the double-fronted cottage is a very prevalent uh, form in that part of the world and looking at what their key um, features were as well. Uh, the building components that define those um, buildings, um, and obviously on main streets, you can get more elaborate materials and, and more elaborate architecture, more strained buildings and more strained architecture on the minor streets. And then where, what those materials actually are and where they come from. Um, we're very lucky we had Leo um, with us on the um, concept. Um, and he realized that, that Newquay was built effectively on um, three hills um, divided by um, these rivers and at the moment everything feeds off the historic town centre and you get these ghastly sort of dead suburbs um, out on the periphery. If we have added to it, we've done on the same model. And his vision was that each of the hills would have its own local centre which then gives you a much better structure for the long term. Um, in the event, because there's already an existing local centre up here, we didn't want to, to destroy that and a lot of this land is undevelopable because of its um, great other constraints. We've modified his vision a bit. There's one main um, new local, new, new town centre here for this new development and a series of small local centres uh, around the periphery. You can see the um, isochromes to show the um, walking distances. In terms of character, each of these has a different name drawn from the um, surrounding area. Nans Leden, which is the name of the whole development, uh, uh, it means wide valley in Cornish. Uh, and by calling them these names, it immediately starts to evoke a particular uh, type of place. And of course, something of this scale won't be the same all the way across. You need to have that, that variety from one part of the town to the other. So this, this all helps on that journey. Uh, looking at the uh, really a master plan, going back to our 19th century Roman model, is a movement network. Um, so this was looking at the main routes um, across the site. And at Poundbury, where the relief roads built around the edge of the development, here we want the roads for the middle of the development to create the heat. <coughs> For the economic centre to work um, there, so effectively get a new high street um, through the heart of the town. And that's a big shift from the um, work that's been done at Poundbury. And a series of minor routes in, in blue there, just to warm up these other um, quieter areas. Um, with our urban design team, we've been developing a computer um, uh, modelling tool, which we call Place Logic. There's a website for it. It's on uh, now, and this produces a, a very quick um, heat map of. Uh, urban network so you can test whether the assumptions you've made at the design stage are realized when you actually come to see the desirability of certain routes over other routes and so this was a, a quick health check and you can see that our main routes were picked out um, fairly successfully but you can then use it as a design tool to make sure you get the network um, working properly uh, this was an early aerial view showing the possible character of the sort of wide market street uh, in the town center we we're going to have to put an enormous um, supermarket um, at this stage on the north side of that. Uh, luckily, the market <laughs> dropped out of that particular type of building now, so that won't get built. But um, the idea was to make it into a market hall with smaller buildings around the edge to give it a, a finer grain um, so it met the surrounding blocks in a more satisfactory way. Uh, we've got some listed buildings and old farms to deal with. And one of the um, part of the food strategy was to encourage allotments and people growing their own vegetables and so on. One of the models we've got are these little local squares with um, allotments and, and a play space within a walled. Um, garden so you can put your child on a swing and then go and tend your um, onions it's all very safe and, and family orientated um, we've been around all the traps on energy uh, we've looked at various kinds of, of biofuel and solar energy and wind energy and so on none of them really work very satisfactorily and so the um, way we're looking at at the moment is to minimize the demand for energy with fabric first approach to the uh, insulation and air tightness of buildings then to meet the residual demand with gas boilers and every house has a, a wood burner as well so if you want to you can be pretty much off-grid uh, except for electricity 
Um, we've got planning concern for about 1,200 houses at the moment. Um, this is the first uh, 500. Um, and you can see a, a rough phasing plan on the um, top left-hand side. That will no doubt change um, over time. And what we do with these master plans, it's very important to get different architects involved. The different colors here represent different um, design hands. So the idea is you give a sensible block to each person. But along any street, you get you know, three or four different um, designers working as well. And that hopefully is a way of getting variety with also um, designs which are well integrated with each other. Um, that's an aerial view of um, the corner of uh, phase one, which is on site at the moment. You can see an Art Deco building, which you wouldn't have seen at Pambury um, as well. Uh, we think Art Deco is part of the seaside vernacular and also is sort of almost classical in its, in its um, uh, rigor and, and its compositional um, language. Um, and, and again, they found from Pambury that with these sorts of projects, um, spaces of six to 800 square feet rent very well commercially um, in, in these sort of fledgling communities. And that's the same size as one or two bedroom affordable apartments, which can go on the upper floors. So you then start to create bigger buildings that can help to define key corners, uh, which don't break the bank because they're quite simple and cheap to build, um, which um, play their part in the urban floor. You probably can't see these very clearly. These are some of the um, buildings, some of them on the minor streets. Um, and from the studies of Cornish vernacular, we know that most of them are very um, simple. Because we've got this consortium of house builders, um, there, they give us their standard house plans. All we do is to arrange them on a block plan and re-elevate them. So the architect is focusing on the public realm rather than on redesigning um, little houses for people. And that is not very expensive in terms of fees. And it does mean you can really add value where you can uh, make the most impact. On the main streets, um, the ground floors are a foot higher. And that gives you a different character of building with slightly more elaborate architecture. It means you have the opportunity of the ground floor becoming used for commercial um, uses in due course. And it does give the scale of the street a completely different um, character from the minor um, new streets. Um, total design, as you can see, an Art Deco um, bus station, which is going to be built next year, hopefully. Um, and the first stone railway bridge in Cornwall for over 100 years that also has full planning permission, uh, result of many difficult meetings with people who wanted to say no, but apparently they, they couldn't. Um, another innovation, um, every um, house produces 100 cubic yards of waste which is enormously expensive to cart off site and not very green either. Because we own the hinterland on the edge of the development, we've got a planning consent now for all the waste produced by the development to become a sort of Tuscan landscape with a series of, of um, terraces going down a hill where we can take the water that comes from the um, Suds urban drainage system at the top and store it in tanks. And it's used by gravity to irrigate the walled gardens and the allotments and then the um, orchards and so on on the, on the lower um, bits as well. And this move alone saves over six six million pounds in, in value by not having to pay to take the uh, earth off site um, that's an indication of where we are in terms of what we have to consent for um, and this was a, another site in Newquay, which is um, nearly finished now which is really the tester for um, the ideas which i've just been explaining to you um, this is nearly as i say under construction um, where you can see sand of developer houses um, just elevated by individual architects about 5% of them have special elevations, whether it's natural stone, as you see here, um, or hung slate, as you can see at the top there, or a more expensive render. Um, and they're positioned on key roads where you get a bigger impact in the, in the um, urban form. And the rest of them are just painted brick or painted render. Um, but I think because the language is much quieter than Poundbury, they're much cheaper um, to build and they need to be in that part of the world, hopefully creating a good townscape uh, at the same time. Um, so the key points really for Nans Eden, um, which I think are similar to Pamper, but slightly different because of the reasons I've explained, the dedicated landowner with a long-term interest, the strong vision, the holistic approach to sustainability centered on lifestyle, the ongoing consultation, the flexible master plan, the use of covenants to control people beyond um, the planning stage, the consortium of developers working together, um, the reflecting local urban and architectural form, using local supply chains, then the steady phase delivery uh, in tune with the local market so you can actually create a proper place and apparently the aspiration was to create one job per household so they've got 1200 houses 1600 <coughs> jobs there, so it does work as a, as a model for um, producing a proper town rather than just a, another um, residential estate so onwards and upwards thank you very much for listening to me thank you
young man up front. Uh, not so much a question, but just a thank you, because I don't think we could have had a more perfect presentation for this point in our semester. School has been only in session for what, three weeks? Three weeks, four weeks, four weeks <laughs> and what, what impressed me in the first half of your talk was you talking about the background, the sort of your, your formation of your ideas and so on. Almost everything you said are things that I've either personally heard or said in class over the last three weeks. We were just having a discussion today in the afternoon about some of the things you were talking about. So I really appreciate the timeliness of the presentation. And, uh, and so I want to thank you for that and, and for your support. Last year, we had a, a presentation and a discussion with another gentleman from London who was doing a lot of planning around London itself. And one of the issues that came up was how to keep affordable housing in an area that's really desirable. And so in a place like Conbury or in the one that you just described, how, once once it sort of gets out and everybody realizes that they want to be there instead of in a slum that, you know, often sits on. Have you found anything that can successfully keep houses affordable or dwellings affordable in a really desirable place? But the issue there was once the land value goes up, the taxes go up and low income families can't afford it no matter Yes, it's a very good question. It's one that comes up in parts of central London now, too. I had a day with the Grove Estate two weeks ago where, where this was a major problem for them. They got some of the most expensive real estate in Europe. And most of the people who own property, they don't live there at all. So it becomes a ghost town rather than a functioning place. I think they've realized that they need to actually sponsor um, affordable blocks there and just take a hit on them uh, in financial terms. But more and more landowners in Britain now are setting up their own registered social land or business. So effectively, they've become the social provider of housing and they maybe um, offer a lease for 100 years or amount of time to, to another provider who actually may run it for them they get the reversion of the building in due course so over that next 100 years it's an affordable um, plot and they get a rent off it but then in due course they get the reversion of the building back um, as well and that's not the complete answer but at least it staves it off for 100 years and it does mean you do get a mixture of people um, there in a commercial um, environment um, <coughs> another way is these little enterprise units um, too, which would say rent really well. And although the affordable flats don't create much of an income, the income off the uh, commercial space on the ground floor can be quite significant, and that can make them a lot more viable um, as well. So, and, and if the great mistake of all these things is looking at it incrementally. And another thing we've learned from Nans Leiden is that in economic terms, this was the great benefit of having the house builders on the same side as us. If you look at an affordable block, you can't afford to make it into a beautiful building because it's just not justifiable on its own terms. But if that block is in a key place in the urban fabric, and you want it to be a prominent building because it's the right thing to do to make that corner of the town work, you might spend more than you would do in commercial terms on that building. And then we call it like a game of golf. And you're, you're a few shots over par on that building. So across the phase, you save some money on another um, building, make that a bit simpler. So across the phase, you're cash neutral you sort of spend the money where you add the dividend and add the value to it and, and so it makes way of justifying it and giving you the kind of character of place that you want and but it's going to become an increasing issue in these more historic town centers where values get very expensive I think. yeah very good point are you required to make some of these affordable housing units available to the what does that mean what does affordable mean and the different categories are affordable. Mm -hmm. like, it's like a short term, that is. <laughs> like oligarch affordable. There, there's some that, uh, are apparently just for rent, so they're just, you know, families can rent there quite cheaply off the council. Um, there are ones which have offered a discounted rent, so they're sort of intermediates. And the ones that can have part equity, so they can buy 20%, 30% of the, of the house, and when they move on, they take their money out, and that gets them on the, on the housing ladder, but then it goes back to being an affordable house for the next family um, as well. And as each phase comes forward, there's a discussion with the housing officers to ha how to gear that correctly to respond to the local need. But because our relationship with the community is so strong there, you know, we can have a very constructive conversation. They'll tell us what they want. I lived in Palmer a few years, and, and there's a this may be a little bit critical, it's brilliant work, but, but the housing is very often don't have windows facing two sides. And that's American as well as British. It's 
sort of like there's no end way, you know. And I noticed in one of the previous photographs that 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 may have been an issue of when you're building these elevators. So. Um, it was a good point you raised, Douglas, and it's one that we, it is a problem. But the um, uh, all the buildings are naturally lit, so that no building is more than sort of um, twelve yards um, deep, uh, and that helps. For a start, so you like it, it forces you to have a, a form of a, apartment inside it, which is going to have windows facing both ways. We try and arrange it so that the front doors are on the main streets. But for affordable housing, they, the landlords like to have their own dedicated courtyard at the back, so that gives you um, often access. To, you might have a core with an entrance onto the street and a, an entrance onto the courtyard at the back, and then that becomes your own sort of semi-private area where you can actually have windows facing um, both ways. Uh, and so that gives you to agree. Best you can solves the problem, but that's that's the yeah, best we can get. Yeah. One last question, comment. I was curious if you made a comment about the, um, how your clients uh, they appreciate a traditional classical exterior, but they uh, you get pressure from them to uh, have more of a free form plan and. Um, I wonder if you tried erasing that. And, and I'll, there's an architect in Chicago, Stuart Cohen, he's coming here from Africa. But, um, he's gone after this. He's tried to embrace it. And um, I think with a lot of success, have you, have you tried to do the same? Yes. In fact, I, for a number of years, I taught in Virginia on a summer program there with um, all the Lothian people and, and, and Peter Hodson, actually. On, on a number of the houses in, in Richmond where we were staying had these pocket doors, which I'm very um, keen on. So, but, Doors that fell back, you start to sterilize large amounts of space for furniture and pictures and so on. But pocket doors mean you can actually have quite big openings that give you a more free flowing plan. So you can open the house up for daily living, then you can close it down again if you want to entertain and to hide away the children and the broken plastic toys. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, to answer your question seriously, I mean, that's part of the answer. But often people want a, a, a big family kitchen as well. And sometimes I, I do it with a you know, screen of columns that might se you know, separate off the sitting area from the dining area in the kitchen, but it's still one big room. Um, I, I like to, the interior to have a residence with the exterior rather than just be a complete sort of uh, non-secretary, but um, just trying to find architectural devices that give you the, what, the space that they want. And they often want some character inside as well, but just um, they don't know how to articulate what they want really. And the more one does, you start putting up a library of, of photographs you can then use to have that conversation. Um, but it's trying to find devices that can create that sort of layered separation between different kinds of space that give the interior a definition and a character that you want it to have, but at the same time make it flow more freely than it would have done 30, 40 years ago. Well, please join me in thanking you better.